What in this world is God doing? Hi everyone, I'm Janie Jones. Welcome to session eight of Discovering Good News in John. Today we'll look at six more of God's attributes, this time those related to creation. These attributes will help us understand what God is doing in this world. The first attribute is God is independent. Independent means that God did not create heavenly creatures, people, and animals because he was lonely or in any way needed us. Paul in Acts 17, 24 to 25 explains, the God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. God does not need creation, but creation is entirely dependent on God. God is not created, which makes him not dependent on anything or any being. Rather, he has always existed and will always exist, as Psalm 90 verse 2 declares, Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Romans 11.36 tells us that all of creation is from him. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever, amen. God takes joy in people as he says in Zephaniah 3.17. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. That God rejoices over those who belong to him with singing is pretty amazing. A second attribute is that God is personal. God is not an impersonal force like the force in Star Wars. He is personal and alive. Millard Erickson writes, He is an individual being with self-consciousness and will, capable of feeling, choosing, and having a reciprocal relationship with other personal and social beings. He identifies himself in Exodus 3.14 as, I am who I am. We see him throughout scripture, interacting with people. The temple and sacrificial system taught the Israelites how they could draw near to him for fellowship. Jesus' atoning sacrifice is for the purpose of bringing those who love God into his presence for eternity. God is truthful. This attribute means that God is genuine, tells the truth, and is faithful. Genuine means he is the true God, not a God made up by people. Jeremiah 10.10 10 says, but the Lord is the true God. He is the living God and the everlasting King. At his wrath, the earth quakes and the nations cannot endure his indignation. Jesus prayed this to the Father in John 17, three. And this is eternal life that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. God always tells the truth. In 1 Samuel 15, 29, God says, he who is the glory of Israel does not lie or change his mind, for he is not a human being that he should change his mind. Hebrews 6.18 claims that it is impossible for God to lie. Notice here that lying is impossible for God. God is also faithful. He keeps his promises. In Numbers 23.19, he says, God is not human that he should lie, not a human being that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians 5.24, The one who calls you is faithful and he will do it. The Bible is filled with narratives showing his faithfulness to his promises. One of the most amazing is his promises to Abraham of a child through Sarah. She bore the child of promise after a lifetime of barrenness when she was well past menopause. God is holy. Psalm 99.9 calls for us to exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy mountain for the Lord our God is holy. Holy means he is separated from all that is sinful and he is completely pure. James 1.13 explains, God cannot be tempted by evil nor does he tempt anyone. Sin can neither stain nor defile him. In the Old Testament, if something unclean touched something clean, the unclean object defiled the clean object, making it unclean. Likewise, someone with a contagious disease, such as leprosy, could pass the contagion to others. But when Jesus walked the earth, he could touch the leper and make him clean, as Matthew 8, two to three shows. A man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately he was cleansed of his leprosy. 
everyone else was warned not to touch the leper lest they become unclean. But Jesus touched the leper and made the leper clean. People are not holy though, and being in the presence of a holy God makes them aware of their unholy state as the prophet Isaiah experienced. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings, and they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips, your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. Isaiah 6, 1-7 God's holiness made Isaiah aware of his unholy state, and he feared he would die. He confesses his sinfulness and need for cleansing. Then a seraph acted to remove his guilt and atone for his sins. Theologian Wayne Grudem defines sin as, any failure to conform to the moral law of God in act, attitude, or nature. Sin separates us from God and incurs the penalty of death. Yet God provided a way to release people from death because, our next attribute, God is merciful and gracious. In an earlier session, we saw that scripture says God is love. His love shows itself in two other attributes. God is merciful and gracious. When Moses wanted to see God, God passed before him and described who he is. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty. Exodus 34, 6-7 Mercy is not giving punishment that's deserved. Grace is giving undeserved favor. God's mercy shows in the tender compassion toward people, even while they are far from him. God's grace displays in he himself providing the sacrifice needed to atone for sin. Romans 5.8 says, But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God longs to show mercy and grace. In the Old Testament, the Israelites abandoned God, robbed, oppressed the poor, murdered, and sacrificed children to demons. Therefore, God sent them into exile for 70 years, but said this in Lamentations 3, 31 to 33. For no one is cast off by the Lord forever. Though he brings grief, he will show compassion. So great is his unfailing love. For he does not willingly bring affliction or grief to anyone. God's heart longs to extend mercy and grace, but he will afflict when it's the only way to end evil and bring a people back to relationship with him. God's grace and mercy shows in his desire for all people to be saved, as 1 Timothy 2, 3-4 explains. God our Savior desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. 2 Peter 3, 9 says something similar. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. God is wise. In session two, we said that God is omniscient. He knows everything, even our inmost thoughts. That God is wise means that he knows what to do with that knowledge. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Romans 11:33. Wayne Grudem writes, God is not only all-knowing, but also all-wise. This means he always chooses the best possible goals and the best possible means to meet those goals. He is the only wise God, Romans 16, 27. His omniscience and wisdom are why we know that in all things God works for the good for those who love him and who have been called according to his purpose, as Romans 8, 28 assures. God and wisdom created the universe. Psalm 104, verse 24 declares, How many are your works, Lord? In wisdom you made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. 
God knew before creating angels that some of them would choose to rebel. He knew before he created the universe that Adam and Eve would disobey him, but he chose to create angels and humans anyway and already had his plan of salvation in place, as 1 Peter 1, 18 to 20 explains. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. The wisdom of God's plan to save us through Jesus is displayed in three ways. First, God's plan justifies Satan's judgment. Apologetics professor Clay Jones writes, if Satan rebelled because he thought he deserved better, then it's no surprise that he would try to make the case that his impending doom is unfair. Thus he becomes the accuser of our brothers and sisters. Revelation 12.10, see also Zechariah 3.1 and Job 1. In fact, Satan literally means accuser or adversary. By accusing the saints, Satan tacitly argues that he isn't the only one who can't meet God's standards. No one can. Therefore, God asks too much. He sets the bar too high. Jones continues, Thus God sends Jesus. Because Jesus kept the law perfectly, he justified Satan's judgment. Consider Revelation 12, which tells us about the devil's defeat in heaven. Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of the testimony. For they love not their lives even unto death. Verses 10 to 11. One thing we learn from this passage is that the accuser, Satan, couldn't be cast down until Christ was victorious at the cross because until then, Satan's argument had some merit. As G.K. Beale put it, until the death of Christ, it could appear that the devil had a good case since God ushered all deceased Old Testament saints into a saving presence without exacting the penalty of their sin. Satan was allowed to lodge these complaints because there was some degree of truth in them. But once Jesus honored God in spite of immense suffering, he justified Satan's judgment. Satan's case was lost. Second, God's plan proved God's righteousness. God's righteousness demands that sin be punished. Until Jesus paid the penalty for people's sins, God could not be proved righteous. Wayne Grudem explains. Paul speaks of Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood through faith, Romans 3.25, author's translation. Paul then explains why God put forward Jesus as a propitiation, that is, a sacrifice that bears the wrath of God against sin and thereby turns God's wrath into favor. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins, Romans 3.25. Paul realizes that if Christ had not come to pay the penalty for sins, God could not be shown to be righteous. Because he had passed over sins and not punished them in the past, People could rightly accuse God of unrighteousness, the assumption being that a God who does not punish sins is not a righteous God. Therefore, when God sent Christ to die and pay the penalty for our sins, he showed how he could still be righteous. He had stored up the punishment due to previous sins, those of Old Testament saints, and then in perfect righteousness, he gave that penalty to Jesus on the cross. The propitiation of Calvary thereby clearly demonstrated that God is perfectly righteous. It was to prove at the present time that he himself is righteous and that he justifies him who has faith in Jesus, Romans 3.26. Third, God's plan glorifies God through man. Isaiah 43, 6-7 tells us that we're created to glorify God. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth, everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. By justifying Satan's judgment and proving God's righteousness, the cross glorifies God through people who are called by the Lord's name. The Lord displays his loving kindness and mercy while at the same time maintaining righteousness and justice. All the heavenly creatures join with earth's grateful inhabitants to glorify God for his great wisdom. Today we looked at six more attributes of God. God is independent, 
personal, truthful, holy, merciful and gracious, and wise. He put his plan of salvation into place before he created the world, and now we are seeing the wisdom of his plan. It justifies Satan's judgment, proves God's righteousness, and glorifies God through believers. He is truly worthy to be praised. Thanks for watching. This week in Discovering Good News in John, complete chapter 8, The Vine. We'll answer the question, what did Jesus say to keep his followers from falling away? See you next time.